Enemy of the state. An enemy of the state. Enemy of the state. Dank Podstash. You're listening to Enemy of the State's Dank Podstash. Visit thedankpodstash.com where you'll find our shop, calendar of events, and more. Become a patron or bitbacker and join us in our private Discord server where you'll have access to live shows and post-show Q&As. Business owners, you can advertise on the Dank Podstash, reach a larger audience, and make more sales. Just email us at dankpodstash at gmail.com for more details. Welcome to Enemy of the States Dank Pod Stash. Got a kind of off the cuff episode today. Original plans fell through, so I called on my buddies Hody and Jeremy to help me throw something together for you. It should be good, and I'll talk about that in just a minute after we bring you a message from Liberty Under Attack Publications. Uh, So we have a special offer from our friend Shane over there um, at Liberty Under Attack Publications. He's an author, content creator, he does the Vanu podcast, and much more. And his offer for listeners of the Dank Podstash is to take 10% off of your order at libertyunderattack.com using the coupon code DANK10. And what you can use that coupon code for are a few books he has uh, focusing on self-liberation, freedom strategies, solutions, and more. The current books being Hashtag Agora, Second Realm Book on Strategy, Ben Stone's Sedition, Subversion, and Sabotage, and Shane Radliff's very own Vanu, A Strategy for Self-Liberation. Shane also offers assistance to new authors throughout the publishing publishing process, uh, which consists of editing, proofreading, formatting for Kindle and paperback, and full-service audiobook production. So head over to Liberty Under Attack Publications, share your story, find your freedom. Thank you, Shane, for providing that. And now to the episode. These two guys, Jeremy and Hody, are two of the people that I think are the most about building bridges uh, between all kinds of different people, anarchists or not, libertarian, uh, different hyphens, hyphenated anarchists and whatnot what have you so we're going to jump into that a bit Uh, i think possibly two very different approaches uh one more abrasive maybe as of today jeremy (laughs) with the stuff you've been going over and hody you you have a much more soothing (laughs) soothing presence in a lot of this stuff (laughs) i was hoping i was going to be the edgy one this time i'm still behind (laughs) jeremy on that huh So what's, what's the abrasiveness? Let's jump into that. Well, first of all, let's talk about, uh, we've talked about it before, but remind people about uh, Ann Cole, Jeremy. All right, well, what uh, Ann Cole is, anarcho-coalitionism is, is it's militant organized panarchy. And the point of Ann Cole is to um, not just unite anarchists, which has been attempted and, you know, done with limited success before, but to sort of organize the particular approaches in any given time to specific targeted goals so that once these goals are completed those alliances can dissolve and people can go their separate ways to form whatever societies they want under um, the new anarchist paradigm it's primarily focused on education and sort of bringing enlightenment to the masses, talking about, you know, various schools of anarchy and getting people on board so that the new society can form and stay formed. Um, And it's also to do with, uh, once those people are informed, uh, getting them on the same page for various goals. For instance, uh, anarcho-capitalists and communists can both agree that uh, the war on drugs should end. Um, Anarcho-communists and agorists can both agree that uh, state-controlled markets must die. Um, You know, agorists and mutualists can both agree that economically we uh, we would benefit from more lateral transactions. Um, And these sorts of conversations and agreements that we can have um, are the basis for a potential coalition that is overarching made up of many smaller sub-coalitions dedicated 
to various uh, goal accomplishments by necessity and by convenience. So essentially, it's a, it's, it's a series of overlapping alliances all under the same banner, which is smash the state and destroy the system that destroys us. Hell yeah. Yeah, and we had talked about this a bit earlier, and something you brought up and something that I've been finding to be very true lately is when building bridges, it's, I want to say it's important to build bridges to people that want that bridge. Mm -hmm. And the people who don't want it, it's just uh, kind of opening a pathway for them to come over and fuck you over. Yeah. I mean, it can. And that's, you know, that's the thing. Like, I'm starting this Ann Cole thing because I don't think just saying panarchy is enough. I think you have to organize and post some strictures to your, to your, to your panarchist alliance or it won't actually have any effect. It'll just be a bunch of people arguing. And so that's coming from a rather cynical perspective that's coming from my pessimism that's coming from basically my dim view of humanity uh and it's also coming from the fact that um i'm entj personality type i don't know if you put any stock in myers briggs but i'm the leader asshole i'm i'm good at saying what needs to be done and finding good people to do it so the structure of ann cole made sense to me and all you have to do is find people who people want to organize with, and uh, the organization will take care of itself largely. Um, but first you have to say that many people suck and many people are excluded. Like, for instance, the people who want to throw people in gulags or put them on a wall and put bullets in their head like some uh, supposed and alleged and comms and ansoaks do or throw them out of a helicopter or into a wood chipper like some supposed and alleged anarcho-capitalists do. Um, those people are not coalition material, obviously. So you have to know where the snakes are in the grass, pun intended, and you have to stomp them out and keep them away. And eventually the anarchist coalition has a potential for long-term success because we know how to root that stuff out and we're willing to do what needs to be done in order to do it. Hell yeah, absolutely. And I, I identify with that in a big way because I agree with the stomping out of the snakes in the grass. It's a source of constant frustration is running across those snakes and getting into the conflicts, you know, uh, just in discussions and, and whatnot. And then to hop it over to you, Hody, it seems like you throw yourself out there a lot uh, to the wolves quite often to a lot of these people. And uh, you stick to it pretty tenaciously. And I've never seen you lose your cool either, which is impressive. Oh, thank you. I, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't take anything personally because it's all just ideas. Plus, it's all over Facebook, and I know that a lot of these people um, aren't disciplined, and so they'll they'll ha we'll have a conversation, and they'll say something that I know they wouldn't say in real life. You know, I went to a wedding a few months months ago with somebody who threatened to to kill me, and he saw me, and obviously, did he kill me? No. <laughs> you know, we in fact, he hugged me and apologized. It was like, hey, I didn't know you were going to be here. I'm sorry, man. And that's just the way it goes. You know, it, it's it, people like to be aggravating and then all of a sudden it comes down to the real deal i cite uh the one time where this one girl was like i kill every cop i see and so i isolate myself so i don't see cops and her friend was like well your dad's the chief of police and you ate lunch with him <laughs> last week so when did you when did you start doing this wow and she was like shut up this is my online persona i'm trying to be like really edgy and cool look here's the issue i want to and, and before we necessarily branch into mine I, I really am excited for what jeremy's doing because so he, so one thing that I learned I studied uh, the works of uh, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. in college, I I was studying theology, but he wrote he was a reverend right, and so he had a lot of religious things to talk about. One of the things that we noticed that was true, both in the scriptures in the Bible, as well as Martin Luther King Jr. himself, is that he would say how to protest or how to organize or how to live 
10 times for every one time he would mention like a principle or a point. Look, if you're going to get a hundred different people on the same page, you're, here's what happens in anarchy today. We argue about these hyphens, these labels. We argue about these little minute, minutiae in detail and then say, you know, I mean, I went on a debate and, and at the end of the debate, the person said, well, the reason, you know, people would respond and say, the reason I think you won is because at the end you said, yeah, we had a friendly, we had a friendly discussion and I appreciated it and I, I value his opinion. And the other person uh, in response was like, this person is the enemy to me because he advocates for my total enslavement, you know, and all that. We, we know how that goes. You know, we see it online all the time. And, and the issue is, is you just can't be like that. You need to tell people how to organize if you're going to get on the same page. Look, the reason Martin Luther King Jr. was successful was because he would say, hey, guys, don't initiate violence a hundred times. He didn't have to tell them very much what to get angry about. People knew what to get angry about. Okay, people in this movement, in the liberty at large movement, anarcho at large movement, we know what we're upset about. We've hashed that out forever. The issue is we're the only people willing to have conversations about it because we don't build bridges to the other side. So we sit here arguing within our own camp and trying to figure out who belongs in and out of this camp for forever. And we never actually progress. We never say, hey, Let's get on the same page. So I'm really excited to hear what Jeremy's doing even before I, I mean, I'm not starting my own thing. I'll just join in on that. Well, okay. So the, the primary thing that, that I think is valuable is knowing who is truly interested. Now, you know, there are people involved in the coalition that are much nicer than me. Um, and I'm not going to say that, like, because I started this thing, I'm a saint. Um, that's the opposite of the truth. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like the Fight Club speech. I'm the same kind of shit that floats around everywhere else. Um, so that's my particular bias there. Um, but the nicer people uh, are often uh, a good contrast when I have been too abrasive, which means effectively there's a time for a good cop but there's also a time for a bad cop, because I also get some success in being abrasive. Now, for instance, uh, you want to talk about building bridges with the outside. One of the ways that I have successfully uh, done some work in that regard is by being patently clear about the kinds of things that, um, that, that we don't accept. For instance, uh, the, the, you know, what if the child consents those stuff that's been floating around? I have made it patently clear that anarchy is no home for pedophiles and that pedophiles will get to eat some metal if they're ever near anyone uh, truly anarchist. Um, and that has actually opened me up to some, uh, to some people on the outside because they're like, thank you, somebody said it rather than, you know, pussyfooting around and saying, well, you know, the age of consent might need to change, or, well, you know, um, the, 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 the government has been the reason this has been X, Y, and Z. Um, I just put a hardline stance. If they're a child, you don't get to fuck them. And b saying something as simple as that, you know, laying it out there, um, that you don't get to victimize somebody by preying on the fact that they're inexperienced enough to have sex with somebody usually as ugly as a pedophile is, um, and, you know, as personality and mentality ugly as they almost guaranteeably are, um, preying on them is not okay. Saying that, just being willing to say that, gets many people who weren't considering anarchy on anarchy's side especially uh, people who would consider themselves, quote, MAGA. And the reason that's the case is because the establishment narrative of anarchy is the strongest survive, anything goes, and, you know, no holds barred. Now, since that's not what anarchy is, since that's not what we should be doing, um, it's very valuable to lay that out as a barrier. And there are various other things that can be easily said about what we don't allow 
that make a lot more people convinced in approaching. And when I do that, when I'm that harsh and abrasive, putting up a hardline stance, and I get a lot of people in agreement with me, it actually makes people much more comfortable. So I think that there's times to be sensitive. If we're talking about a sensitive subject somebody is sensitive about, let's say I make a joke about troop suicide and uh, a veteran comes on and says, you know, they're, they're crying right now because it reminded them of their buddy that shot themselves and they're considering doing it too. Um, maybe it'd be a good idea for me to let uh, the pacifists I know who are also anarchists get in on this and say, well, look, um, maybe his joke was a little extreme, but maybe you're also, you know, not considering the fact that it's a response to something that would be considered extreme under different social paradigms. Maybe my joke is what gets some responses. My abrasiveness is what brings some people in to argue. And then the nicer people in the coalition can be like, well, hey, I get that you're upset, but have you considered X, Y, and Z? So, yes, I could see putting people, some people off with some abrasion, but I can also see that you can bring people in sometimes and that when you don't bring them in immediately to your side, you can oftentimes get them there after they showed up because your statement was so extreme that it got eyes. It's sort of like the clickbait principle. It's like just this side of yellow journalism, but, you know, it's, it's not far enough over the line that I'm uncomfortable with it. Yeah, well, and, it, and it's important to I think what you're saying is it, you need a variety of voices. Mm -hmm. There's not one voice that's good for everybody. We hear, uh, you know, I, I'm Mormon. We have a missionary system, and if you ask questions that are way over one missionary's head or just something he's not comfortable answering, we'll give you a different one. You know, this this is important. If you're saying, well, this person's very good at dealing with matters of the heart, then that's one thing. I'm very good at dealing with matters of the head. That's another thing. Hopping off of a religion, we need to do the same thing with anarchy mm -hmm. we need to be able to say me i have a huge i still have a tough time calling myself an anarchist because i love history and i'm familiar with where the word anarchist came from and who invented it i'm familiar with the origin i'm familiar with the what happened to cultures that tried to remain anarchists, and they are super gross right and so i i like i kind of when i call myself an anarchist i'm aware that like you said the social paradigm totally changed right now you know, anarchy is a more comfortable place to be. Right now, we have a bigger problem with being a-holes to people on the internet than we do with anarchies of the past. You know, but it's still something that's in our history that we have to explain. When you talk, the reason you're going to get reached when you condemn pedophiles is because human trafficking and child trafficking were huge hotbeds under anarchies in the past. So people, especially people like me, Examples? I get turned on by that. I get turned on by, oh, uh, uh, Somalia, Jamaica. Really? Uh, really? So, hang on. So, so you're actually citing Somalia and Jamaica as examples of an overarching anarchist paradigm. Uh, Jamaica, let's see here, 1843. This is just off of Wikipedia where they said they're anarchists, but they're really closest to uh, the, the, ex the people who visited um, were like, they're pr pretty much in uh, an oligarchy because yeah. they don't realize it, but there's just not an official government system in place, right? And so, you know, places that do without governments, you know, that are listed anarchies, I guess, by the world's definition of anarchy, by the Wikipedia definition of anarchy, if you look it up, those places are not good for children, See, right? Oh, they're, they're rapist hotbeds. Oh, okay. You know? Well, and, and, so, and my question, like, well, my, my second question would be as to who invented it. That, that, you, that you were bringing up. That, uh, I don't mean to interrupt. I was just like really curious about that. Oh no, Prudhon's the first person to ever call himself an anarchist. And so this is the, this is the, this is who it comes from, right? He not only was against the government, no rules. Yeah, because this is what we say. Oh, anarchy technically means no rules, but the modern anarchist movement is okay with social hierarchies or, you know what I mean? Like societal hierarchy, hierarchies, family hierarchies. Proudhon was not okay with that. And so you look at anarchy back in the, I, I guess he invented it kind of early mid 1800s and then you get late 1800s on it and you see 
those people trying to live up to that and it's ugly you know what i mean I mean, it's literally forcing families apart so that the fathers don't force their force their wills on top of their children right and so this is like i mean there's something to be talked about being an authoritarian parent but like i said it's ugly and so people like me that love history kind of look at it and go Huh. and then i hear somebody like you say pedophiles have no place here and i'm like yes this is what i want you know a place where Pedophiles aren't welcome. Human traffickers aren't welcome. Racists aren't welcome. Slavery is unwelcome. You know, this is not a place for you to be. So I'm I'm a I'm talking about building bridges, but like you said, this is not building a bridge bridges with Nazis and pedophiles and places for authoritarian people to have to do what they want with, right? This is a problem with a lot of let's be honest, I think the longest anarchy in existence is I mean, there's the guys in the ruling guys in China which probably is the longest, but as far as on the record, we got like 30 years in the Ukraine or something like that. And that ended with a Holodomor and it was ugly. And so we just say, this is a bad history, but we've changed it. We've made some modifications. We've made some differences. People like you are condemning pedophilia and saying, hey, going into this, families and societies are going to take care of that. We're not going to let that happen. And that is a huge build bridger, uh, bri build bridger, bridge builder. <laughs> to people that really care, that really are intellectually interested in anarchy, people that know their history, people that are intelligent. And then they hear you say that and they're like, maybe I need to give this thing another go because I know that's what got to me eventually. Well, okay, so several responses. First off, uh, Pruden was the first one to write the word in English, but that's like saying that like, you know, the, the American right was the first one to call themselves libertarian, even though De Jacques was the first one to give it a political context, and even though it started out as an alternative to determinism. I mean, if you want to talk history, uh, the, the origin of anarchy was its discussion as a lack of archonic figures in ancient Greek philosophy. It wasn't created by Pruden. Um, so there's that part of it. And then secondarily, um, the... Anarchist societies usually still had, um, the, the anarchist societies usually still had an overarching aggressive social paradigm forced on them by a central figure. I don't qualify that as a lack of archonic presence, um, including Somalia. It was never really anarchist. It was always uh, ruled by gangs, etc., warlords even when it didn't have a government that people like the UN recognized. So let, let, let me be completely clear. Um, I think that the commonly accepted definition of anarchy is bullshit, and it's made by people who want to ignore history rather than actually embrace it. And that's that brings me to my third point, which is that um, when you discuss history and discuss the failures of anarchy under situations like the Holodomor, it's fine, but you should probably also admit that the host of historical examples of statism were a uh, bloody conquest to a gradual dissolution and eventually chaos, mass death, and the extinction of a civilization. So, I mean, you want to talk the Holodomor... I got Mao's killing 50 million people. Uh, I got Stalin killing seven, uh, sorry, 17 billion, Hitler killing like 12 billion. Well, maybe, right, right, right. And maybe you don't understand. The Holodomor is how it ended billion, for the billion, ANCOMs sorry. in the Ukraine. Well, right. This is how it ended for the ANCOMs in the Ukraine. That was done to them by a statist government, mm -hmm. right? So this is... I, this is definitely not me advocating for statism here. What I'm saying is that's how it ended. They they basically put rules in place that made it so that they were unable to defend themselves. Right. Yeah. Uh, specifically that. Yeah. And so because they said, well, property is a, a spook and an artificial construct, and our, and and property is wrong, so we're just going to eliminate the entire concept of property. And, and so then, and, and I get it, like I get where they're coming from and there's, there is some intricacies to talk about with property, but they basically decided, hey, no one's allowed to enforce their property. So what happens? The USSR surrounds them and starves them all to death, mm -hmm. steals their stuff too. I mean, it's based, they basically got taxed without having a government, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and so you need, 
you know, any type of anarchy, like you said, we learn from this. So we say, okay, what do we need to do in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, we need to have some type of people tread on me and, you know, that don't tread on me snake needs to come up to life and really bear its fangs sometimes. I like the porcupine. So, yeah, I'm not saying, yeah, don't step on me. (laughs) Uh, It seems like. Yeah, uh, I feel you. Some of the examples you brought up there uh, before Jeremy responded are what people see because they're what you can find, like you said, on Wikipedia, in history, in someone else's story of what happened. Yes. Um, And that's, like you said, where we get this convoluted definition of anarchy and move to Somalia. It's anarchy. There's no government. Well, there's no traditional government in those areas necessarily, but there's warring, whatever, warlords, uh, people trying to establish governments, but... Well, and, and to be completely, like, level, a government does not need to represent its people. A government does not need to be kind to its people. Plenty of feudal lords would be uh, inarguably government, but still extremely cruel and self-serving. And so I don't see a gang of people who governs a territory as not a government. The Crips and Bloods, as far as I'm concerned, are governments. And if you disagree with their rules, there are equal or worse consequences mm-hmm. to what some governments present. I think the distinction between overarching gangland turf wars and government wars is one made by people who want to have an idealized version of what government is. But let's be completely frank. Government just means the regional controlling power of a uh, given ter- uh, territory. Um and it doesn't actually need to have any basis for its control. In fact, you want to talk history, the entire wealth of enlightenment has been about trying to make government more liberal, trying to make it represent the people better. And then anarchists come along and just say, well, hey, this doesn't actually represent us jack at all, and maybe we should, like, not do this anymore. And so, I mean, if if you want to if you want to talk history, there's a huge wealth of things to consider in terms of the government actually being anti-representative, and therefore, all of these things that were considered anarchies being basically not. Um, and one of the great things about living when we do is that we can use these you know massively powerful machines and go and explore history. At least you know if we're willing to parse the bullshit that people pass off as history, because hey. As Rothbard so eloquently put it before he got senile, um, the idea of revisionism is fine if you admit that uh, history has been written by some really evil winners. Um, so if, if, if we establish that governments don't have to represent and often don't, uh, I think that that's a good way to start the conversation because then all we need to do is do better and have societies that don't function essentially by gang, mob, state, king, fucking whatever rule. And then we're fine. You know, we can move on as, as a civilization of people enlightened to believe that rulership is not in our best interests. Yeah, what you just laid down is a perfect uh, cornerstone for the buildings of a bridge. The distinction, like you said, between gangs and traditional government and that they are the same. Mm-hmm. in many points so i'm, I'm going to be bringing that up because i know you guys are just going to keep motoring on and i'm happy to listen to you but i'm going to jump in with that ding ding write that down there's a good foot uh foot hold for you when building these bridges yeah um i oh, did yeah. want to swing back to oh if you have more on that hoodie i'll swing back to it after no i i was just gonna say but this is where the bit bridge building I keep mixing up those words. This is where the bridge building aspect is, though, is to say, hey, I I agree. Those are huge problems. I hate those gangs. I hate pedophiles. I hate, you know, I hate corporations that masquerade and act like they're capitalists. That's that's lunacy. Right. And this is how you can say this is how you build that bridge with that somebody. For me, like, here, here's the big thing. When somebody says they're a minarchist, I see an opening. Right. When 90 percent of the anarchist community, I won't say 90, when the very loud portion of the anarchist community sees somebody calling themselves a minarchist right now, what what do they do? Threaten them, tell them they're violent, tell them their status, uh, dox them, threaten to rape their girlfriend because, hey, you're raping. You're going to you're going to rape us. You're trying to enforce all you dude overreaction and madness. If you're a minarchist, that means you've said, 
I've recognized that as little government as possible is great. You just need to convince them, I believe, that you know, you're just really close to saying no government, right? And this is how you build those bridges with those people, not by threatening to dox them or saying, you violent statist and acting like a nut, but by being like, hey, I'm really glad that you've recognized that the least government we can have is great. Maybe there's an opportunity to have no government. Let's talk about your few hangups and see if we can get you to cross that bridge, you know? And see- That's okay, all I had, but and, go ahead, Nick. Well, and, and just one thing to say about that, I mean, that's one of the areas I build bridges very effectively because I've read a lot of leftist literature. Um, and one of the areas that I do reach uh, people at is saying that corporations are capitalists, that there's a such thing as voluntary mm -hmm. capitalism and forced capitalism. So, I mean, there's that too, where like, if you can get the capital that you need to make your stuff work by the force of the state, it's not actually separate from the previous way capital was accrued. I mean, we got westward expansion, manifest destiny, slavery, all of these things forming the root of the American economic system. And essentially, uh, there's no argument to be made that, you know, any any capital accrual, accrual over the past several centuries has been any better than the corporations. Uh, especially since m much of it was uh, born of those corporations. So I don't see that as a fundamentally good argument myself. Um, and also, from the bridge-building aspect, I try not to go down that road with minarchists because I started out my life, um, my political life, when I was like in high school, being a hard-edged, Bush-supporting neocon. I was a fucking cunt. I was not a good person, and um, I know that, you know, if it's possible for me to come around, it should be possible for many people to come around. I'm just cynical about the prospect of people actually doing it, which is why I'm an asshole. But I'm not an asshole to minarchists more than I'm an asshole to anyone else, and in fact, usually less, because at least they're trying to walk this way. You know, we all take our first steps awkwardly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One thing... Uh, so, yeah, as you know, I rag on the Libertarian Party often and happily. And one thing that I like that you, Hody, and Trisha Stewart have brought up is that it, it can be definitely used as a pipeline to anarchy, uh, to teach agorism, because some people aren't ready for the jump from, you know, the typical Democrat, Republican, whatever you are in big government, straight into that world. And... I, I like the fact that there are people within, I guess, the party, if not fully within, but around the party, they're willing to continue that funnel. Um, and I, I had thought about that a lot after both of you mentioned it. And I was thinking to myself, well, I just it's still compromising. And then I thought about my conversations with people that I meet, you know, in bars, anywhere. And thinking well, I compromise in my conversations with them quite a lot because there's some information that will just completely turn them off to the conversation. So there, there is compromise in conversation and for good, uh, for, for a good end. Um, you got to choose your battles pretty much. But what I wanted to get back to was kind of the, the purity spiral that we find ourselves in online. Um, once we have people all to this place where we've built the bridges from, and then we're tossing people off the edge. Um, like Jeremy said, it, it's good to stomp the snakes out of the grass because they will cross those bridges, but it's fucking toxic. It's, it's absolutely horrible specifically on Facebook. And I don't know what, I, I guess it's the an anonymity of the, the platform and probably a lot of platforms that leaves people to that. Yeah, I, w I was going to say it's it's definitely not only Facebook. I experience no, yeah. the same stuff, and I'm on like 10 different social networks regularly. Mm -hmm. and Twitter, definitely. Right. Uh, all kinds of places. It's just absolutely toxic. And it's probably the most challenging thing is to keep those bridges up with these with other people in these areas. And, yeah, what are, what are you guys' thoughts on that? Uh, real quick, I, the only thing I've been able to to think of that I can do is to be uh, who I want to see. And as soon as I step out of that and start trolling or being a dick, the universe just slaps me right in the face 
with you know some kind of retaliation from somebody. So I, I'm trying to rein it back, and I want to know what you guys think about that. Well, uh, let me start with it, and then I'll turn it back over to Jeremy because I have some strong thoughts on it. Look, there's a difference between stomping, stomping out a snake in the grass and dip, and a difference between stomping out a child in a crib, right? When you're a kid, you you know they talk about children need milk, adults need meat, right? You kind of graduate, right? And so are you stomping out a snake, someone whose intentions are ill? Or are you stomping out somebody who's just misunderstood, who's somebody who's a little lost, somebody who's young, somebody who's new in the movement, something like that. You know, I think that this is where we really need to have care when we tread. Now, I shouldn't say we, because I agree with what Jeremy said, different voices. If people want to be the go-getters and the angry people, look, I'll admit, we don't overlap circles an awful lot. But if that's how they get there, then that's how they get there. You know, I think it's Larkin Rose who talks about the reason the reason he's an anarchist is because somebody threatened him with violence because they said your ideas as a minarchist are violent and I'm going to beat you up for it and beat him up. And so he said, oh, yeah, they're right. They were right to be violent with me because I had violent ideas about the government, you know, and so that works for some people. For me, no. Like, it's a huge turnoff. But guess what? We don't have to hang out all the time. We don't have to be buddy-buddy and hug each other, right? That's just, that's him, and then I'm me, you know? And so we got different ways of getting there. Um, I hate, man, it's weird that I keep using all these religious references. I'm not trying to do this. But they talk about the church being the body of Christ, right? But no individual is supposed to be Christ. It's one of these weird, like, when we try to be Christ-like you know, no individual is supposed to be Christ. You as an entire unit are supposed to perform the miracles that Christ performed, right? But some of people are going to be eyes. Some people are going to be hands. Some people are going to be feet. Some people are just, you know, they're going to be the brain. Some people are going to be the heart. And you just got to find your place within that, you know, and do what you excel at. For me, I excel at this gentle, nice approach. I get you know, I, I am a huge evangelist for libertarianism, and it happens on my page almost on a weekly basis where somebody's like, man, I'm a libertarian because of you, or, you know, I'm feeling the liberty because of you because I take this nice, gentle approach. Jeremy probably gets the same response with a much less gentle approach. It's okay for us to have different approaches and be different. The real difference is Jeremy and I are both intelligent people and no one we're targeting a snake, and we say, hey, get out of here. I'm blocking you. I don't want you on my page. I don't want you talking to other people. You are an able. You are attacking genuinely good-minded people, right? These are the snakes. They're looking to chop the kids. We are supposed to protect the kids. So when we see somebody with a few of those ideas where they're like, man, I would love liberty. I just am not sold on defense, uh, what property would look like, what the economy would look like. I'm just scared of human trafficking. I'm scared, whatever it is, be like, hey, come here. We're going to help you out, either me or Jeremy, whichever approach you like better. But we we at least know we're dealing with a child instead of a snake. That's that's what I got to say about that. Yeah. And, you know, um, I actually meant to bring it up earlier. I'm I'm trained like I'm an atheist now, but I'm trained to be a, a preacher. Um, like, you know, I the, the whole time growing up, it's part of the reason I was a Bush supporting neocon because of the church I grew up in. Um, I was trained to be a preacher. And one of the things that you that you get trained in is knowing your gifts and not trying to overstep, um, seeking out help in your in your community, in your temple, in your church, etc. Blah blah. If you need that sort of thing, you know where to find it and you seek it out, um, and you, you you talk to the elders. You know you try and form those those communities, those strong communities, and that's actually part of the thing I don't like in the modern day is these atheists saying religion has no value. And the reason I say that is because a lot of religions were the reasons many strong communities formed. Um, and we can take the same aspects with very little tweaking and apply them to any philosophy we want to see succeed. Form good communities. Know your strengths. Don't overstep. Um, Matthew Matthew 7, 8, I think it was, or 7, 5, it was, it was one of the two. You know, hypocrite that thou art, that, that thou uh, seeks to remove the moat in thine brother's eye before removing the plank in thine own. Uh, you know, basically, don't, uh, don't, don't judge uh, where you would not want to be judged in the same measure. You know, these things are all, you know, Christian, Christian values, and they're they're all like religious, whatever. But they're also good, and uh, so I like I don't want you to feel like 
because you're religious, the things you say aren't valuable, or you shouldn't say the things that are valuable because they're religious, because neither of those are true, and uh, religion uh, has adopted a lot of good philosophies into it that should not be forgotten. I mean, Ron Paul uh, talking about the golden rule in front of the Republican National Committee and getting booed should be all your evidence that uh, that you need, that people need a little bit more of that religion in their lives. Cool. Thanks, man. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate you saying that. It's got to build bridges with, with people that you see differently than you. I don't like to fight religious wars because it's so deeply personal. If anything, I like to harness that and say, I want you to live up to the tenets of your faith without anybody getting in the way of that. Or, or forcing you or making it seem like... Because if you're not really walking with God, then your walk isn't a Christian walk. If you're not voluntarily doing it, it's not Christianity. The same thing with anarchy. If you're not voluntarily doing it, if it's just a thing you do, then it's a, a phase you will grow out of later. And, um, you know, it's the same thing with my statism. It was a thing I was doing because... Uh, my parents, the military town I grew up in, they all wanted me to do it. I mean, I was strongly considering joining the military when I was 18, 19. Um, but I'm glad I didn't. And the reason I didn't, the reason I didn't join the military or become a cop, even though I got the brain and the attitude for it, I'm very angry and I'm okay with the idea of killing Is that beautiful people. head of hair. You have to keep that, right? I didn't actually have it when I was 18, 19. I'll pull out my ID in a little bit and show and show off my image there. But um, the, 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 the reason I didn't is because I put myself through a little crucible. I decided if I, if I wouldn't be okay with watching it, I wouldn't be okay with doing it. Um, so basically, after being uh, a libertarian for a little bit, because even though she hates admitting it, my mother is the one who told me about libertarianism, um, because I was saying I didn't think I was a Republican or Democrat at, uh, at, at 18 when I was about uh, able to vote. Um, the, my transition from libertarianism a couple years later to anarchy was watching those videos, was trying to reconcile uh, my belief that government was necessary with the actions that they do. Um, and I couldn't I couldn't do it. I just subjected myself to hours straight of watching war footage, uh, police brutality. I decided I'm not okay with it. And ever since then, I've been trying to refine it. And I think that's what people need to do. I think that they need to find their, their linchpin and see if it's really worth it being there or if they should pull it out, pull it out like pulling off a Band-Aid. Um, and, and a lot of people aren't willing to keep their linchpin once they find it out because their linchpin is usually something very simple. Their, their linchpin is usually not something like military or police. Their linchpin is usually like healthcare. And then I bring up the fact that you can, you know, go to a private hospital and it's cheaper. Um, or education. I bring up the fact that schools indoctrinate rather than teach people how to teach themselves. And as a result, we've got a huge class of people that knows how to do what the school wanted them to do and not how to do anything for themselves. And they're like, oh, and so, like, you find that linchpin, a lot of people are willing to come over. And, uh, and so I just try to find that. And that's my skill. I'm good at poking the bear and then being reasonable when people get in. Like, honestly, I put off this, this intense bullshit persona. And then, like, when people actually get there, I make a sound economic or whatever argument. And they're like, oh, you know, I was expecting fucking the Kyle meme. <laughs> and so, like, <laughs> I, I put off this air intentionally because I want to keep out the people that aren't willing to come across at all and um, and are only okay with people who are, like, already where they are. Um, and when I eventually realized this, I started using it and getting a lot of traction. Like, I've, I've got a pretty big following places. And, uh, and... All you need to do is find out what your skill is, and oftentimes you can use that to your advantage in ways people without that skill can't. For instance, I bring her up all the time because she's a great example, but um, uh, Agorist Kitty on, um, on Twitter, she's a pacifist. 
and she's good at discussing things with people on a pacifist level because she really tries to live the pacifist life. And so part of her approach is to be nice, to try and find that, that middle ground. I don't do that. So when I, when I need that, I'll tag her in or I'll send her a, a direct message with the link to the tweet or something like that. And that'll give her an opportunity to come in with her way of doing things. And I'll do things like that variably with, you know, various different people. Um, for instance, I was talking to this thread full of boomer trumpets the other day, and they were all on, th on board with, like, you know, anarchists are nothing but dumb kids. So I posted the image that somebody else made. I didn't make it, but it's very good, which is uh, a collage of a bunch of old anarchists in black and white pictures, and it says anarchism, basically just a bunch of edgy teenagers. Um, and it lists, like, 30 faces of, uh, of anarchist thinkers in their old age. Um, and uh, I tagged 10 people who I know are older than me. And, uh, and in doing so... This entire thread suddenly changed direction, and like six or seven of them blocked me. But I have three or four of them who are following me now and uh, and engaging with my content. And I think it's that sort of thing. Like I'm I'm abrasive, yeah. And some of those people that blocked me might not like my approach, sure. But what uh, what they can then later on do is talk to people who don't have my approach. And maybe find that ground afterward, um, once the ideas that I presented stew a little bit, because that's part of it. Like, I try not to, I try not to be too harsh, um, but a lot of the time I can be. And in the end, when they find out that hey, he he's not always harsh, he's got like a thing behind it, um, they they can often come around and 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 be more convinced. But I try not to do that because that's trauma bonding. And it, like the ideas that come from that often don't last. It's why you can't hit a child into discipline. So um, I try to just stick with like the, the, the switch tack if I'm going to do that. If, if, like, if I'm going to do that, I, I, I try to switch over as soon as possible from my fucking edgy trolling to education. Um, but, you know, okay. like I understand if people don't want to do that tactic and some people who don't, are actually extremely successful. So I try to have them in my camp too, and that's part of coalitionism. It's building effectively a body of anarchy and trying to make it work. Like, And that's the reason I work with Christian anarchists really well, because they understand this already. But if we can spread this idea of knowing your gifts and not misusing them or wasting them, putting them under a bushel, or being like that son who didn't spend his money at all, uh, and had to give uh, had to give everything he had to uh, the other people, you know. I think that things would be a lot better off. Absolutely. I mean, I've I've people heard the debate on this show between me and Jack, and I have tagged him in some posts recently because I I said, hey, here's somebody asking some questions that comes from the kind of lefter socialist side that still that is concerned and wants to make they're interested in anarchy, but they want to maintain their socialism. Let me have them talk to Jack, you know, and I, I linked him in it because knowing those connections is really what it's all about. If we're going to unify over anarchy, we really got to boil down all the other differences and say, not that they're not important, not that people won't form communities around them. Like you talked about early, but earlier, but, but that this is the core, what we're going for is this anarchy. The ability to make your own decisions supersedes everything. You can't have anything without it, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're going to unite with that. And then all those other little differences, whether it's, I mean, one of the things that I love about the Enemy of the State podcast, thank pod stash, is because I can say, hey, you know, are you interested in like some way over the top memes that you know and 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 maybe you got that atheist leaning you're interested in that agorism then i know who to link i know where to send you to my show is nothing like enemy of the state but i'm a huge fan and people say well is that hypocrisy no it's just understanding that we have different roles in this jeremy you and i would get along well even though we might not have a whole lot in how we talk or our belief systems in common because what we can do is we play off of each other 
do I want my linebacker or let me say this, do I want my quarterback to look the same as my offensive lineman? Absolutely not. I want them to be built entirely differently because they need to accomplish different things. We are up against a very vicious football team. And so I want some really beefy offensive line guys and I want a really lean quarterback back there, you know? And so they aren't going to look the same. Jeremy, Nick, David, me, we aren't going to look the same. I, maybe that's a bad example. That's a whole bunch of middle-aged white guys. But you know what I mean? <laughs> maybe those all look the same. But you know what I mean? We got all those different guys that really do. They, 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 the appearance is an analogy to more of our dialogue, our context, our character you know, who we are, those things are going to be different. Right. But if we can unite all of those forces and not just unite them, but be friends, then that really is something that says, I believe this anarchy can work. Because before we'd have these little spats, right? Uh, over these little differences. I, you know, I bring up the idea of France a lot where they exiled somebody because he was like, shouldn't we be able to defend ourselves if somebody invades? And they kicked them out. And so like all these little differences, we say, hey, maybe you don't like that guy. But if that guy helps lead to you having a freer life, maybe at least support his ideas, you know? <laughs> and this is what it looks like, is this enemy of state exists, we're libertarians exist, all these different levels. The Libertarian Party exists, maybe we don't need to sustain it, but it exists. And if we can leech off of those and say, hey, come on a little bit further, then hey, why not, you know? Let's use every tool we can, let's use every person we can, every character as a unique set of gifts, like you said. And we should use those gifts to the best of our ability because we really aren't in a place where we can afford that luxury. We're fighting an uphill battle. Uphill yep. battles have been won before. We need to look to the examples of Martin Luther King. We need to look to the examples of, I mean, heck, if you want to talk about it, Spartans. I mean, we need to say, yeah, we are overwhelmed right now, but you know what? We are not going down without a fight because this mission of individual liberty and the self-ownership of your life is way too important to just say, mm, I'm going to let my difference in mutualism and capitalism completely overturn the entire movement. And I'm going to, and, and I'm going to be selective and only capitalists or only socialists are allowed in my anarchy. Come on, get real, know where you're at. You got the luxury of doing that as soon as the government's gone down until then enlist in the fight, man. Mm -hmm. that, and that you guys brought it right around to the next thing I was going to bring up. And it's finding the people who can see the forest for the trees, all the different ideas and whatnot, but that one remaining problem being the state and who are willing to get together and still hold their beliefs, but work with people who have different beliefs to take care of the main problem. Uh, that is the source of most contention online is the bickering on philosophy, economics, and all that stuff, and um, that's it's, it's the hard one, probably one of the hardest ones to solve. But we're slowly, I don't know, you guys have been on this podcast multiple times now, and we've all become friends uh, because we're slowly finding those people, those groups who are willing to do that. Um, I had a point before, but I got enthralled in what you guys were saying. <laughs> well, and you know, two things. Uh, first off. Uh, I, w I want to take this opportunity to say um, Weekly Hellscape will be back as well if you need another mm -hmm. podcast to put in your agenda and you want the worst of the worst news to make your Friday worse than it has ever <laughs> been in, in the past. Um, feel free to check that out. Uh, I cover how evil everything is getting and how the demons are crawling out of the closets. So feel free to do that. Um, but like finding that common ground is often a matter of throwing something out there. Um, like, the, a lot of what I see is people trying not to step on the toes that they like. But mm -hmm. if the toes that they like are toes that are respectable enough, they should be able to withstand some mild criticism. And the, the thing that I've had to unlearn is this sort of weird demagoguery and, like, cult of personality worship that, like, pervades a lot of modern thought. And, uh, you know, like, be willing to challenge people who you know other people wouldn't be willing to challenge be willing to be just the same person that you are with everybody else to that person in the same way like if you're a pacifist and you're suddenly really really violent with somebody uh people are going to wonder where your pacifism is they're going to wonder how consistent you really are and if i'm a brutalist with everybody and then somebody comes along and i'm like very ginger with them 
they're going to be confused. So over the past year, what I've been learning to do and uh, been doing it relatively effectively is talking to people within the movement that are high up uh, on the same level that I would talk to anybody. And what I've noticed is a lot of people were waiting for someone to say it. And, um, and that kind of being willing to be a disruptor, not just, not just targeting the people at the bottom and then dick writing the people at the top when they say the same thing the people at the bottom were, but targeting everybody equally. Uh, I think that gets a lot of people on board that otherwise wouldn't be. I mean, you want to talk the Libertarian Party. Um, like, I've been hitting people in the Libertarian Party for a while now. Uh, especially because of the way that their politics have been favoring the milk toast, the sort of washed out, and the sort of like, we're not actually libertarians, but we're going to call ourselves that because we're not quite Republican or Democrat. Um, you know, targeting them gets me a lot of people who are in the Libertarian Party who are like, yeah, you know what? I really don't like Gary Johnson. Why was I supporting that? Um, you know, and being willing to do that, being willing to consistently punch up keeps the hierarchy more horizontal and less vertical and prevents personality cults from taking over. And if many, many people were willing to do that, hell, you see me as a top, fucking knock me down a peg. Do what you have to, but make this work because it's not going to work if we allow inefficiencies and ethical um, indiscretion to take over. We're just going to encourage snake charmers rather than their exterminators. I did mm. recall my point that I had forgotten earlier, and it's, uh, as far as the bickering between different philosophies, uh, economic or otherwise, and uh, for a specific example, um, it, let's say people bring up the, uh, ANCAP specifically bring up the idea, uh, maybe make a post about it, saying that voluntary communism can exist alongside capitalism. And people hop in there and say, nope, can't do it because in the future they're going to come take our stuff because they don't respect property. And vice versa. Um, uh, communists aren't willing to allow uh, capitalists to exist because their hierarchies are eventually going to oppress them. And it's, the, it's this scenario. I didn't know we had so many fortune tellers who could see the future who could say with certainty that this is going to happen. These people are going to attack us. Therefore, we dehumanize them now and don't allow them either into our circles or don't even consider working together with them because of some scary boogeyman in the future that could happen. Uh, that That's something that is definitely needs to be stamped out. Uh, it's First of all, you're never going to know that until it's able to be tried, until it's, we're able to ha try stateless societies of different persuasions living next to each other and then examples of one economic system crushing another economic system under states under different states governments whatever don't apply to that situation oh yeah here's how i view i can speak for the ancaps because i'm an ancap myself dude if you're one of those ancaps shut up okay if your free market is really the best then Put it in a free market system against other economies and just be the best you know like here's the here look here's why communism fall, falls apart it's not the involuntarism it's the lack of division of labor i mean that's even according to the ussr communists they publish their autobiographies and they're like here's what we really struggled with and here were the problems it wasn't the fact that they mandated it that's bad that's scary as a political philosophy but but that part is optional, right? I mean, George Orwell, the leading voice against socialism, as far as you know, was a socialist, right? He was a socialist. He just simply believed it should be voluntary instead of involuntary. Look, maybe I think it's a bad idea, right? Me and this socialism, communism, mutualism, whatever you are on the left side, bottom line is I'm willing to fight it out in the open market. You know, I don't need to force anybody to do this. The idea that the comms would somehow get so popular that they would force you to do those things. Look, that, that, that neglects two major things. One is it saying, well, they still have the power of like some kind of vote in this anarchist system that could make you a communist. Look, the whole thing is that if each individual is the authority, then there's no collective system to force you into their economic system, even if it's only you or a couple other people. 
right? Point number two, and this is this is it. Each individual is the authority, right? If I decide that I like it better one way, here was the problem that a lot of socialists had that I, I love to laugh at them for in the mid 1800s, right? Because they said, well, ultimately, somebody's going to make the best burger and everyone's going to universally agree. And then there's only going to be one burger joint ever. Dude, bull honky. All right. Some people prefer McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's. There's always going to be these little preferences. I right? make the best I burgers. like this amount of salt. I like and Jeremy Harding's my personal preference if you guys are going for burgers, right? And this is why we really need anarchy is so those big corporate fat cats at the top can get out of the way and let Jeremy's burgers take over. But the uh, look, here's the thing is like there's going to be all these little differences. There's going to be all these little changes. You know, so when we talk about capitalism versus mutual, oh, oh, the incomes have to go away. Look, first of all, the incomes had the longest living anarchy again, according to Wikipedia, but you know, that's the longest one so far. So shrug your shoulders on that. If you really feel like talking smack, they've made it work better than anybody so far. And point number two is again, this is the individual authority. You get your preference, you get to decide, even if theirs is more successful, let's just pretend communism was more successful, but you prefer capitalism. As long as there's one or two other people that are with you, then you're going to be able to have a system where your capitalism can exist and they leave you alone because ultimately in anarchy, the individual is the authority and you maintain that power. Yeah. And, you know, first off, I want to say uh, shout out to Hoplu if you're still, quote, not making that response video for your fucking scribbly trash that you that you that you threw at me. But um uh essentially uh i made the same argument back to him because he said oh well communists are going to take over because ironically they would steal your burgers like that was his <laughs> that was his object in his video that he used for his analogy and i'm like well first off we get really touchy about burgers yeah <laughs> well and, and i was like well first off um under communist precepts that burger is the product of a specific laborer's labor, and that laborer is entitled to what it created. So, I mean, you want to talk mm. communist theory, they would say, that is not my burger, sir. That is the burger of the McDonald's worker who made it. And those, those, those tools in McDonald's uh, should be in the commons. Now, you can disagree with that, but if somebody signs a contract to work at a place where they're not making burgers for themselves, but making them for other people, that was consensual and voluntary. And in a truly voluntary anarchist paradigm, it would be interesting to me to see uh, how those two competed with each other. But the question is, would communism outcompete capitalism? And the, the, if, if, your, if your answer is that yes, it would outcompete capitalism, then here's the rub. If you're a capitalist who believes that capitalism should be voluntary and communism would beat it out if it was also voluntary, then capitalism is inferior to communism because the market has decided it so. And so you can't say that as a capitalist who believes in voluntary capitalism. You have to say, give it a chance. And this is where a lot of people get very angry with me. Because I'm not just saying, you know, what they want to hear. Same with communists. They say, well, capitalists are just going to usurp all the resources. And I'm like, uh, maybe, but they're not usurping all the resources in any, in any given territory now. They have to compete with each other still, right now. And in a truly anarchist paradigm, uh, people would be educated on, you know self-ownership, the kinds of things that would it, that it would entail to have a long prevailing paradigm of anarchy, and they probably wouldn't allow resource monopolization to begin with. So the question you have to ask yourself is, um, is your system worth forcing on people? And if not, you must let it compete. And that's the other thing. I think th this is my fortune telling I'm a cynical, pessimistic asshole, and I am not afraid to admit that I think we're all going to lose, and in fact, we're all going to die young among one of the elite's prefabricated disasters that they're designing their bunkers to avoid. I think we're fucked. <laughs> so that's my prescient thing, and I think no matter what people are arguing uh, up here on the surface about, when they escape to their hollow world, we're all fucked. 
So maybe we should align and stop, you know, quarreling over these arbitrary lines, universities and, uh, you know, essentially capitalist media has wanted us to. And, um, you know, realize that we should stop being fucked. That's my particular bias. One more reason Jeremy doesn't have any need to lie to you. Because <laughs> it wouldn't <laughs> fucking matter. And in the right. event that there were two opposing economic uh, societies living next to each other and one failed, wouldn't it serve the goal of long-lasting peace and freedom to be ready to welcome the failed society into your own to build what you have uh, made the best with more people to help them because if it devolves into well see i fucking told you so good luck starving out there it's nothing's going to last yeah you know i recently started my first paid writing gig at uh, polyquads magazine i did an article on the opioid epidemic you can check it out but we'll link um, that. yeah okay well thank you um but this yeah. this article on the opioid epidemic, you were allowed to rebut people. And my only rebuttal came from a socialist who, in his own piece, said that even if um, these pharmaceutical companies got sued into oblivion or you know regulated into oblivion for what they have essentially, in his words, done to the, uh, to, to, to the American people, um, even if the people be, behind Purdue um, Pharmaceuticals were rendered penniless uh they too should be treated humanely and to me i think like i am a cynical asshole and i probably wouldn't because if you fuck up that majorly and you've already got millions of dollars in savings and sending your kids to ivy league schools you bribe them into i don't give a shit choke on your loss but there are people who aren't like me who would gladly take in the people of Purdue Pharmaceuticals into their uh, capitalist empire and say, hey, you can be my garbage boy. And that's fine. You can do that. I don't care. Although, you know, to be honest, that's pretty bad, a uh, pretty bad eventuality. It's just, you know, it's still me being sadistic because I hate these people. But uh, they would probably be more likely to give them a higher a higher functioning role in the in the in the corporation of their choosing because well the company because corporations are state creations the company of their choosing because why waste talent but you know i just i, I kind of want them to suffer so even in my good scenario I'm, I'm making them you know it's it's my fantasy damn it but either <laughs> way yeah i see where you're coming from hody hit us with some final wisdom we're right at an hour all right uh so for me i think if you can build a bridge absolutely build the bridge uh and here's the thing you don't need gatekeepers to stop to stop disingenuous people from getting in disingenuous people hate when you're genuine they hate intellectual honesty if you are intellectually honest you're going to end up squishing some snakes. You don't have to say, oh, I better go snake squishing today. I better go hunting for some snakes. I better go find some enemies. Look, enemies find you, right? And this is what happens when you preach truth. Liars hate it. And so for me, that that's the way it goes down. I, I feel fine and I make conversion. I get great reach because I talk to people in a kind way because that's my way right it doesn't need to be everybody's way but the thing is, is if you're anything like me you don't have to go seek enemies you don't have to say well i'm not getting as many people agitated today maybe i need to go stir the pot a little bit look we everybody's got a different role to accomplish in a different way and you don't need to say to go out of your way too much you can just simply say the truth if you're a pedophile or racist you are not welcome here you are not welcome in this community you know, we want to eat you alive or feed you some metal, as Jeremy nicely put it. You know, this is and and just saying that makes them say, OK, I don't need to go hunt down a pedophile. They simply know I ain't going to F with no anarchy because I will. I don't want to eat metal, you know. And so this is really where it comes down to. And to build those bridges, what you got to do is find find out about your target, whoever it is, learn about them and care what they care about more than they care about it. One of the issues that I've always had with libertarians is they adopted this, yeah, the environment sucks, screw the environment type of thing, mm -hmm. making all these environmentalists go, 
oh yeah the libertarians are cool with smokestacks and we're like and some libertarians embrace it and they say yeah let's pave down the mountains and turn it all into a bunch of industry without realizing how much property defends your air defends your water defends you know if somebody poisons your air you are entitled to reparations retribution whatever it is with that person in a sense libertarianism is way more protective of the environment than any democrat or republican philosophy any bill that they could pass you know as soon as they start polluting your water they don't have to pay the epa you know they got to pay you they got to answer to you on your terms because they affected your property you know and so what it really is is caring is not not caring about the issues and sometimes that's how nice people get watered down i definitely don't want to come across that way i'm not trying to water down the message what it is is i take the issue that they care about which is usually corruption hey i hate it uh the environment i love it you know and and learn to care about it more than them because it is absolutely achievable through anarchy libertarianism through the liberty movement at large you can absolutely achieve a better society because ultimately when you truly have the most control over your own life then the issues that you care about you don't have to beg a government to care about them you make them happen it's your reality and that's the future that we're fighting for is not one where you have to hold out your hands and say, oh, boy, I hope the government does the right thing today because they have an incentive not to do the right thing. What we are fighting for is a future where you say, man, I'm going to go and do the right thing today. And nobody stops you, especially not the government. Hell yeah, man. Awesome. Hody, thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you very much for jumping in here last minute with me. Uh, listeners, it's going to be a little bit chaotic the next couple of weeks. I'm going to figure it out. We're going to get uh, content out here for you. And I'll probably record uh, some stuff by myself, uh, maybe find some other guests. But we'll keep bringing you the awesome stuff like we heard here today. And we'll catch you next time. I'm in